Um, I was actually invited to speak at this conference about a couple of months ago. Uh, and at that time, um, Mehdi, one of, the, one of the organizers, asked me to talk about open data, which is kind of my thing, right? Like uh, I co-founded um, um, an open data agency that's, uh, sorry, an agency that's at the intersection of open data and design thinking with uh, Chloe, who's right over there. Um, and what we do is that we help companies open up their data. So it made sense for me to talk about this. And you know what, if things had gone according to planned, I'd probably be up here talking to you about transport, um, talking about trains, talking to you about something that we've gotten really, really excited about over the last uh, couple of weeks, which is parking. But then something happened. I think this is an image that a lot of people are, are familiar with. Um, so on November 8, one of the typhoons, strongest typhoons to ever make landfall hit the Philippines. Um, there are about 10,000s of people dead, millions that have been displaced, and hundreds of thousands that are probably still hungry, sick, or injured. And, and so here I am, right? So I guess you could say that this typhoon has sort of hacked my presentation in a way. Um, but what it really feels like is that it's kind of hacked my life. So this has been going on for, for almost a month now. Um, I've been working with tech teams that are um, working with the Office of the President. And, it, and when you think of my background, and you think that the fact that I work in tech, and that I'm working with open data, and we're working mostly with transport, um, and Chloe will talk to you about, about that a little bit more later, it's kind of crazy that all of a sudden, now what we're doing is working with hundreds of what I call now humanitarian coders. So maybe I should tell you a little bit about how this all started. So I don't know if Ruben's here. No. Um, so I was on the jury of this international hackathon called Hack for Good. Um, there were about 1,000 of developers on it. And that happened, I think, sometime in, I think was it was in October. And then all of a sudden the storm hits. And I know a lot of you are probably like me in front of the TV. OK, no, maybe more in front of YouTube, um, looking, at, you know, looking at what was happening and feeling like, shoot, there's got to be something that I can do instead of clicking a button that says, you know, give to the Red Cross. So um, some of these guys over at Geeklist uh, contacted me. And they said, hey, look, we know you're Filipino. We've got a lot of people from the Hack for Good initiative that really want to help. Is there anything that we can do? I'm like, I haven't, I left the country about 10 years ago and my family's still there. I've been going back and forth, but like right there and then when they contacted me, I'm like, I, have, I haven't the slightest clue. So what I did is that I contacted this woman who is actually a friend of my little brother, it's crazy how the world is tiny, who now worked at the office of the president. Um, and I said, hey, look, I've got, around 50 people with their heart in the right place that are free this weekend. They want to do a virtual hackathon. And, you know, what, what can they do? Is there, is there anything you can do? And I thought she was going to, you know, brush me off or give me a few, like, comments. But what she actually does is she gives a list. She gives a very detailed list of what it has to be done, that, um, of tech needs that go for, from anything to building an online platform to data cleaning. And then we're like, shoot maybe 50 people for a whole storm like that, it's just not gonna cut it. So we tweeted it, and we you know, put it on our respective Facebook accounts, and we, got, we went up to maybe about 150. And then what happened after that is TechCrunch, Wired, Le Monde, uh, 20 Minutes, and pretty much everyone in France started covering it, and we went to this. So I don't know, is that Loïc? I don't know, you can tell me how many people we've got on it, but last I checked, it was something like 500, maybe? Yeah, and those are just the people that are on the platform, right? That's not counting everyone who doesn't necessarily put their stuff on it. More than 800 now? Oh, yeah. So just, it's been kind of crazy. Um, I have a full-time job, I run a company. Um, <laughs> so this all started happen when this all started happening, we were like, what do we do? Um, how, how are we going to handle this? We have all these people that want to help. 
So, I mean, I can't tell you all the stories of everything that's been happening over what may have been maybe the richest month of my entire life, but there are a couple of stories that I want to let, um, tell you that um, maybe bring some perspective into what I've been calling API aid, um, which basically is either, well, you know, what I'm sort of like my own terminology for now, who knows, maybe you'll pick up, you know, catch on, but um, right now what I'm referring to is either building an API or lending, giving access to APIs. So one issue that we really want to solve is, how can we do a better job of dispatching rescue? I was upstairs um, listening to Audrey's talk on um, open APIs, and she was talking a lot about um, what she called the, the dead pool of startups. And that really hit me because, quite literally, when things fail in a crisis as intense as this, what you wind up with is, quite literally, a dead pool. Um, so I want to show you a little bit what the, what the system was before we started working. So this is a, I want you to pay attention to this because I'm going to ask a question at the end. So this is how rescue works right now in the Philippines, right? So people can either tweet to rescue PH, um, you know, s saying that where they are, uh, who they are, if they know someone that needs help, um, or they could put in that same information through the website, which is rescueph.com. Now, all of this goes into two separate sp spreadsheets that are compiled manually by hundreds of volunteers um, that are sp spend their time micro-tagging. And, and then um, all that goes to the office of the president. So specifically, the, 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 op the part of the office of the president that we're liaising with, which is called the uh, Presidential Communications Development and Strategic Planning Office. So they go through all of the data. Um, they try to clean it to the best of their ability. And then it's sent to the National Risk Reduction and Management Council. And then after that, they go through it again. And it's sent to the Regional <laughs> Risk Reduction and Management Council. This is by email, by the way. And then after that, it's sent to rescue teams. I don't know, how many, how many engineers do I have in the room? Can you, can you just give me a quick idea? It's like, does this not seem like the most ridiculous system you've ever heard of when it comes to rescue di dispatching? I'm going to tell you a little about what, what the consequences are, were of such a terrible, terrible system. Um, one of the major things was that there were a lot, I mean, there's a lot of people tweeting on Rescue PH that have no idea what it was. So in terms of the actual manual compilation, that was a lot of work. Um, on top of that, there's nothing to filter um, people that had already been saved. Um, so what, what is happening is that you had a lot of these rescue committees that were going back out on the streets, back out um, you know, in the floods, risking their lives for people that had been saved like hours and hours ago, because um, there's no way you know, for them to, to show that. And um, just look, you can just imagine also how long this entire process takes. Um, so what we did is we had this, uh, one of our volunteers, um, Gino, who is Filipino as well, and he's on like the linked data team of, um, of Cisco. He's like, you know what, looking at that right away, I feel like what you really need is an API um, that, that will process this, that will, to the best of its ability, um, filter some of the dupes and saves. Um, and then after that, we can start thinking about building um, interfaces for the people on the ground, the rescue committees. But then we could also give you know, instant access to any of the NGOs or any people also, individuals who want to help. Um, so that's something that's being worked on. It's called Salva Vida. And so the API is done. Um, and now we're working on, um, well, fine tuning it, but also uh, um, Sort of build, start, start, start to build some applications on it to make it actually usable um, both by the office of the president and also just pretty much everybody else. The idea is to make it open. Um, another issue is reconstruction. So this is kind of like my, my baby right now. Um, I'm really kind of relieved actually to move beyond the question of rescue and relief into something that we can start thinking about more in the longer term. So the question is how do we build entire cities, right? Not one, but several. So here's a just so you know what it looked like, these are some aerial shots um, that show you basically what our starting point is, right? So this is before the typhoon Haiyan, and this is after. So it's very, very close to zero. Um, and 
when we're talking about reconstruction and you're talking about developed countries, I mean, it's pretty easy, right? Let's say that happened, you know, let's say that happened in Paris. Who would be leading the operations? It would be pretty clear that nobody would be handling anything in the country, in the city of Paris, without it going through the government, without there being some sort of like central coordination process. Well, that's not necessarily the case in the Philippines. Um, there are a lot of very well-meaning NGOs. Um, there are also a lot of um, community-driven initiatives that just, people don't, just don't, they don't hear about them. Um, I went, so I went to high school in the Philippines. I lived there till I was 20. And I can tell you that almost every year, my school would raise enough money to build you know, another random high school that had been destroyed by another random storm, because we have like really about six to seven of these every year. Um, and all of those initiatives are off the map. There's no coordination whatsoever. So the issue is just not how do we build entire cities, but how do we do it together? How do we, um, and another, another issue that's important to me when I say together is, is the Filipino aspect of it. I, I don't think I would have been coming at this, um, this issue the same way had I not been Filipino. But when people talk about reconstruction, they tend to emphasize quite a lot on infrastructure. But you've got the psyche of an entire country as well that's been broken. I mean, you know, we've been completely helpless. Um, we were colonized for over 300 years, and now like, people are coming because we can't help ourselves. So there are a lot of stories as well of Filipinos that are helping Filipinos that haven't been, got, um, haven't been getting out, which, is, which should also be part of the whole narrative of reconstruction. So, what the office of the president asked was, so how do you build um, something that can help us, one, get in some funds directly to community-driven initiatives, to more local initiatives, but also to government initiatives? Because right now, um, the only thing that's visible, every time anybody wants to help, it goes to international NGOs. And two, how do we get everybody to sort of coordinate? Like, I want to understand, like, is everybody trying to rebuild the same school um, based, on, based on the maps of what's been destroyed and what's been, um, and what's been damaged? Uh, what, are there some areas that people aren't paying attention to at all? Like, how, how can we have, like, sort of general situational um, context? And I remember, I think I was talking to, to Dan from, from Geekless, and you're like, uh, which of our volunteers is going to do this? It was just, a, it, was, it was massive. What they were asking for was massive. We were talking about processing payments from multiple countries, um, you know, different platforms, like integrating, um, like different layers of maps, collecting the data, and we're like, can, can, you know, different groups of people working kind of side of like vir virtual hackathon style, could they do this? And you know, like I said, no. <laughs> um, and I want to show you what we did, though, which, which sort of ties into this new idea of, of API aid. So what happened is that I said, look, there's something that they want that's kind of like an online donation platform. There's definitely a part of it that should be able to take in money that's visible outside of, of, um, of the Philippines that can be afterwards used to, ch to channel into different agencies. Um, we're like, wait a minute, rally.org does that. Um, for those of you who don't know rally.org, they're, uh, they're a startup that's mostly known for having built the um, online donation platform for the last um, American presidential elections. And it works very similarly. So I contact them. Um, I sent, I, 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 sorry, I talked to someone about them, and then all of a sudden they're, they're contacting me on Facebook, on Twitter, on email, and it's great. And I, I talked to, to Tom, who's the, who's the CEO and one of the founders, and I was like, look, your platform's great, but to be really honest, it's not exactly what we need, and there's some issues that um, we need to resolve. For one thing, one of the reasons why the government wants this, um, this online donation platform isn't just to get the money in, but it's to see where it's going, to be sure that it's getting there every time, and to make sure that this can be um, made transparent so that people can trust the initiative and they know where their money's going, and they understand it's going to projects and not necessarily just to agencies. Like, can you build, can you build me an API for that? And I'm like, sure. Um, so basically, they're, right now, they're building um, an API that will enable us to create a sort of dashboard so that people over at the government can see which agencies are getting what, when, and know without having to call, which is what they're doing right now, calling and emailing to check that people are getting what they're getting to make sure um, everything, everything's fine. And um, the plus is that because we are working with the, um, the Office of the President that's very into transparency, this dashboard is going to be made completely um, public. 
And then we came across another problem. We're like, shoot, but rally.org up to now, they're quite young, and they've only been processing US to US payments. Like, how, do we, how do we get around that? Um, so um, it turns out that one of, sorry, my, my boyfriend's, uh, <laughs> my boyfriend's co-founder's previous company called Zoom was, uh, is, is a company that actually specializes in sending out money and, and um, specializes in uh, diasporic communities. So they're able to integrate um, to process the payments um, going to the Philippines. And then we're like, but you know what? In the Philippines, like in a lot of other countries, people don't tend to donate via credit card or via sites. They tend to do it via SMS. Is there a way we can make this happen? So what I did is I posted on Facebook. And I was like, hey, can anybody help me get in touch with Twilio? I need their API. And um, Mehdi, so who's the organizer of um, API Days, actually gets in touch with me. And he's like, yeah, I can put you in touch with some people on their team. And in less than three hours, I have like four or five people from Twilio that are emailing me saying, what can we do to help? Um, can I, you know? And, and now we're integrating Twilio into this. We're also integrating Twilio into the dispatcher app that I was telling you about earlier so that people can um, text for free directly. Um, and then the, uh, OpenStreetMap, because of um, some of the work they're doing, Gael Musquet, who's the president of OpenStreetMap, is actually helping us, since a lot of the people that are working on this aren't too familiar with, um, with the mapping scene just yet. Um, I have Eventbrite on that, because I don't know if any of you went to Renaud Visage's talk yesterday, but Renaud's actually leading this project. Um, and he's leading it with the guy, so the res, uh, engineer and, sorry, the resident engineer of Code for America, um, Mick Thompson, so the logos are up there. And then all of a sudden, um, we were having problems structuring the data. Someone told me about Publish What You Fund, that they're already publishing all this open data about transparency, what NGOs are getting. So they got in, got in touch with me as well, and now they're kind of part of the team. So all, is the, all of this, like little bits and pieces, it's kind of like Lego, you know? And, putting it together, and at the end, hopefully we'll have um, Rebuild PH, which is going to be this dashboard for reconstruction. So, um, so the presentation is supposed to be called post um, you know, post high Thoughts on API um, Aid. Uh, so this is the thoughts part, which is kind of, it's, it's, it's not easy. Um, it's still, this is all still very, very fresh. Um, everything's happened really fast, but there are a few things that we have learned, and I really wish I knew them um, earlier on. But I'll just go, th go through them really quick. Um, so as always, focus on your users. I know this sounds really silly, especially for anyone that's you know, ever been in a startup because it seems so intuitive. Of course you focus on your users. But the problem with initiatives like this when you have um, you know, hundreds of developers all over the world that have no contact whatsoever, the Philippines that don't understand anything that's happening there, they're gonna tend to wanna build the biggest, baddest apps with the sleekest design, with the most functionalities. And it, it doesn't, doesn't always, won't always connect with what people need on the ground. Um, one example is, so this dashboard, right? I get all crazy about it, about how it's gonna be great, how we're gonna have all these functionalities, you're gonna be able to do 100,000 things. And we start talking to the agencies in Tacloba and like one of the cities that's been affected. And um, they're like, I, I can't figure out the sign in. Uh, so we wind up having to publish a PDF file um, with huge screenshots of everything that they're supposed to do step by step with letters than like size 48. Um, so that's, that's just one example. Um, so another thing is don't try to reinvent the wheel. Um, this is something that I learned a little later when I started putting together um, Rebuild PH. Really like there are a lot of things that you don't wanna do. Um, so in, in, in the open data world, we talk about uh, the, the toilet finder syndrome. So I've been on the jury of, uh, of a lot of um, open data hackathons. And for some odd reason, I mean, in Europe spe specifically, there's always a public toilet finder application on that thing. And I must have seen maybe a total of seven already. And do any of them exist right now? Do you guys use one? Like, I, I don't. So there's that disconnect. Um, and this just brings me back to some sort of like good old wisdom from my grandfather. Also, um, so I grew up in the Philippines, right? It brings me back to my childhood. Um, my grandfather uh, ran a security agency. And I always asked him, like, you know, what, what happens when I get kidnapped? Um, this is 
something you guys maybe didn't have to think about when you were growing up, but like growing up in the Philippines, you think about these things. So what happens when I get kidnapped? Um, you know, because I was taking classes basically on how to handle kidnapping, and I was like, so I want to learn all the techniques on how to escape. And he's like, oh no, 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 you shouldn't escape. Um, you shouldn't try to escape. Only escape if you're like 100% sure that you're going to make it out there alive. Otherwise, you're just going to get shot. You know, it may sound like kind of like a dramatic comparison to what we're trying to do for, um, for Rebuild PH, but seriously, if today I was trying to process payments from several countries, dealing with the legal affairs of processing payments, trying to integrate that platform, working with like social media integration, doing all of that, I would definitely feel like I had just gotten shot. So, moving on to number three, don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, I think this is, just, this is a great lesson for me, not just as a... You know, not just as someone who, who's running a startup right now, but, but as a human being. No one ever thinks of looking to the tech community for help. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, you know, you, we've got some, like, really fantastic um, engineers in this room, front-end developers, back-end developers, all, all sorts of profiles. And I'm pretty sure that when you saw the storm, the first thing you thought of doing was, like, you know, clicking online and sending some money to the Red Cross. Um, and actually, there's so much that can be done, and no one's... No one's even ever thought of asking them. Like when I, you know, when I started talking to all these companies, like, yeah, your technology works, it fits, I need pieces of it um, to integrate into this thing. They're like, wow, we didn't even think of that ourselves. So don't be afraid to ask for help. In the worst case situation, people will say no. And you know what? It's been about a month since we started up to now, no one has said no to us, no one. And we've got people from the White House um, you know, that volunteered to help. We've got people from the French government volunteered to help. Um, it's just really incredible, like, the kind of momentum that you can get. But um, something that's important as well is don't be afraid to say no to help. Um, you know, in, in part one, when I said always focus on your users, sometimes, you know, when you're handling so many volunteers, it gets a little confusing. You don't know who your users are. Um, sometimes it feels like, you know, I'm just, I'm managing, um, I'm just managing volunteers and, and, you know, a lot of those volunteers wanted to build these, these applications that were kind of cute but not really useful. And it was a really tough call. Like, I remember talking to Dan um, at around 4 in the morning and being like, dude, we've got so many people. And some of, some of these guys, they're just not going to build um, things that we need right now. Are we going to make the call and tell them straight out when we think that they're building something that's definitely going to crash for sure? Are we going to be the ones who are going to say, you know what, it's great, but it's not immediately useful. Can you please go to OpenStreetMap and help them micromapping instead? Or can you please uh, go to the standby task force and help them microtag teats instead? It was really, really hard to do. Um, so if, you're, if you, you have this goal and you have this, like, and your goal is not necessarily to like, you know, be, be at the center of all this attention and deal with all these developers, you have to figure out a way to, to, to say no. And, and do not be afraid to say no. It doesn't mean that people won't want to help later when you go and ask them for help directly. But you know, taking on all that sort of like extra management is, is actually was really detrimental to, to the project. Um, and uh, for, and I'm gonna end with this one. Um, it's think with others. So I'm, I'm really new to, the, to this whole reconstruction relief scene. Um, you know, I grew up maybe going door to door and asking for food and putting everything in the back of the car and then driving it to evacuation centers when I grew up. But this is an entirely different ballpark. And there's some trends that I'm, I'm seeing um, that, and people who've worked in this, even people who've worked with um, Hurricane Sandy and Katrina told me they hadn't seen this before. It's exactly this, this sort of trend of, um, well, it's not even really a trend, but this, this idea of, uh, for one, of of API, you can call it philanthropy or aid, you know, the idea that tech companies are willing to give their technology. But there's also, I think, the most craziest part, like if there's one thing about this that I could say was absolutely crazy, it's the fact that the Filipino government, who was even too afraid to ask the Americans for help when a radio tower was taken down so that it was really hard to signal for planes when they could land, said, okay, when we called them and said, we've got you know, hundreds of developers from all over the world that you don't know, that I don't know, but are willing to help, and they said yes, and they're still working with us today. So when it comes to think with others, like there's no, you know, there's what I'm trying to figure out, and if you have any thoughts, I'd really um, love to hear them, is how do you 
make this into a system. Like, it's not sustainable right now. I'll be the first person to admit that. Like, when, when I leave or when some of the coordinators of this initiative leave, it's not going to continue. And also, like, I'm working on this very specifically for the Philippines and with the Philippines because it's a, it's a place that I understand, it's a system that I understand. But, you know, what from this can be learned um, for other initiatives? Um, so, you know, if you have thoughts on that, it would be great to hear them. So, as you say in Tagalog, salamat, which means thank you. Um, if you want to, you know, if you have any ideas, like to talk also, and I know you're not supposed to do this at conferences, but we need a Ruby developer. <laughs> well, there's a, there's just a, a, a chunk of open source, um, this open source map that we, we just found that was great, that was used in the Haiti um, earthquake to actually map something similar to what we're mapping now. And, no one's worked on it for a year and everything's in Ruby and none of the guys on the team code in Ruby, so just a little, little commercial. So thank you. <laughs>